Hello, and in this video, um, I just want to quickly introduce the notion of remoteness uh, within tort law, specifically looking at negligence. So when you're trying to establish a claim for negligence in tort law, you go through, for example, establishing a duty, then breach of the duty, then um, the but for causation test, and then you look at remoteness. Now, the idea of remoteness is that a person should not be held liable um, for a loss or harm that is um, too remote. And this is very much tied to the realms of economics. This is why it's one of my favorite areas within tort law. So the whole purpose of having this additional step in um, uh, establishing a claim in negligence is to avoid the unfair imposition of liability um, upon the defendant, but it's also for the smooth running of society and the economy because if you put too much onus on defendant, um, as we saw with public authorities, sometimes um, a, a defensive policy can be taken up uh, by public authorities, which is not good for society. And it's the same for firms. They wouldn't want to be so innovative with their ideas or try new things out for they are scared, basically, of these um, onerous liabilities. Now, prior to Wagon Mound, which is a case which established remoteness, the rule under re polymis 1921 was that the defendant would be held liable for all the consequences of her negligence, uh, his or her negligence, so long as they were direct. Now, this wasn't very good law because basically what many people said is it doesn't really do much. So this step of remoteness because it's split into two parts, as we'll see, and I'll have two additional videos. Um, but one is looking at, was there a novice actor's intervenience, i.e. was there um, a new intervening act, um, therefore making that new intervening act liable, not the defendant. And the second thing is the three principles which govern the foreseeability test. And before this, um, all the test and the rule in Repolymus was doing was stating that if there is no nervous actus, then basically um, the defendant should be held liable. So many people said, well, this is not satisfactory. You need a bit more about um, a bit more than that. And in the words of Viscount Sa uh, Simons in Wagon Mound, he said in, by having... Um, the rule in repolymis you may give rise to palpable injustice so you can see that they were very much with this idea that the law has to develop so why do i keep talking about wagon man well wagon mound is the standard case that is used for remoteness and it was the case that established um, that the harm that the type of harm should be foreseeable now in this case basically um you can read the facts, it's to do with a negligent oil spillage which causes fire to the whole wharf. And basically, um, it was held that while, um, oh, and the court held that um, while it was foreseeable that the oil spillage um, might, um, you know, hurt or destroy or cause some loss to the plaintiff's wharf, it was not foreseeable that the oil would be set alight and cause the damage, the type of damage, which was through uh, fire burning arson, um, to the wharf, and therefore the claim in respect of fire damage was disallowed. So this brought a whole new dimension. You are not just asking, was it a nervous, because in this case there was no nervous, but we're bringing in to the idea of foreseeability. Now, I'll have two more videos on remoteness, and the first part is we'll look at what do we mean by nervous, how do we establish them, and essentially there are two ways. You can either have an intervening act of a third party, or the claimant themselves um, could, could have brought about the nervous actus. And the second video will look at what are the three things, the three principles that govern the test for foreseeability for remoteness. Thank you for watching.